Alexa, send a comment to LBC. And thank you to the person who, every, at the start of every programme, says, I love you, Ian. Need a bit of that in your life, don't you? Right, on our panel tonight, we have Baroness Tani Gray-Thompson, uh, crossbench peer, broadcaster and 11-time Paralympic gold medalist. Samuel Kasuma, he's author of the new book, The Power of the Outsider. He was one of the contenders to be the Tory candidate for mayor of London. Tom Hamilton is a former head of research for the Labour Party and co-author of the book Punch and Judy Politics, an insider's guide to Prime Minister's questions. And Emma Ravel is head of communications and public affairs for the Centre for Policy Studies, which I should tell you was started in 1974, I want to say. Yeah, well she's <laughs> nodding. By Margaret Thatcher and Sir Keith Joseph. So that gives you an idea where she's coming from. So uh, let's crack on with our first question. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question. With Ian Dale, this is LBC. John is in Epsom. John, what would you like to ask? Um, I think that the idea of scrapping inheritance tax is a gimmick. Um, I believe. Do you believe that he's only doing it in order to win votes, do better in the polls? Do you believe that Rishi Sunak is considering inheritance tax to do better in the polls? It's hardly a crime, I guess, for a politician to want to do better in, in, the, in the polls, but um, some people would say it may be cynical. Um, Samuel Kasumi. Um, well, like most of the things we've read about in the last few weeks, it's just mere speculation at this point. Um, and if, if true, then I think that, yeah, clearly it will be done because we have an election in the next year or so. I mean, I think less than 4% of the population actually pay inheritance tax. Um, my own personal view is that um, uh, there, there should be a balance when it comes to inheritance tax. Um, there should be a tax. We need that £7.2 billion. Pounds so you wouldn't second. want to abolish it? Wouldn't, definitely wouldn't abolish it, but I certainly think that um, it is important that we recognise that there is a value in people being able to pass down generational wealth or wealth to other generations. And the mo most people who do pass down an inheritance don't don't pay inheritance tax. I think the threshold is about three hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Three hundred and twenty-five. Oh, it's go. been that for many many years. Um, Tom Hamilton, I, I don't know whether you were around in 2007 when this was uh, the la last time there was a big bone of contention when George Osborne made a speech to the Tory party conference saying that he would raise the threshold for inheritance tax and many people think that was the reason that Gordon Brown decided not to have an election at that point and then lived to regret it. What do you make of the current round? Well, I, I was around in 2007 and I was, I, I was born then, but I wasn't, well, I, 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 I wasn't working in politics. That. wasn't working in politics at the time. Um, I mean, it, he did make a big impact at the time in 2007. And uh, to be fair to the Tories, they've, they've cut inheritance tax already um, during the time in government. And you're right about the 225,000 threshold, but the... Um, but, Basically, you're quite unlikely to pay inheritance tax, as, as I understand it, with an estate under a million, which is quite a lot more than, than most people um, have. I think the questioner is, is quite right that... Um, uh, John is quite right that uh, this is an, elect an, an electioneering move, um, if it happens. Um, but the reason it could be a successful electioneering move, to be fair to Rishi Sunak, is that it's a really unpopular tax and it would be quite popular. Um, so I, I, I get the logic of it. I think... The problem is that at a time when uh, the government are saying quite rightly that there's huge pressure on the public finances, when we know that public services are in a state, when we know that most people are finding the cost of living really, really difficult, the idea that a priority should be to cut a tax that is only faced by 4% of the population and by definition the richest people in the population is absolutely the wrong priority. So I hope they don't do it. And I, I hope that if they do do it, um, that the, the Labour Party takes it on and takes the argument on rather than sort of folding on it. Tanny. Um, it does feel like we're gearing up for an election, doesn't it? Sooner rather than later, probably. Um, I know just from my emails in Parliament, just all the briefing notes we're getting at the moment feel like, you know, all the different bodies are, are, are gearing up for it. So I'd say why now? Um, I don't think it's the biggest problem that we have to face within uh, the cost of living crisis that's going on. I think the people who have lots of money are um, very good at protecting it mm -hmm. and thinking about how they pass it down so the number of people it affects uh, it just feels like testing the water um, and maybe just uh, filling up a bit of space while we're on conference recess uh, <laughs> so um, you know we've got, oh how we've, cynical we are <laughs> does that sound cynical um, but I mean I, th I think you know that 
I know, you know, from the work we've been doing in, in the Lords, you know, we've got levelling up, we've done online safety, there's some big bits of legislation that have gone through. It does feel like there's a bit of a vacuum in things that are happening at the moment. Emma Ravel. Uh, I, you know, hate to agree with the rest of the panel, but I, I think I probably do on this one. I think, you know, there is value in Rishi Sunak announcing this now, if he indeed he is going to announce it, because it's incredibly popular with Conservative MPs and with Conservative activists, which are in, in the run-up to an election. What is? Cutting it or abolishing it? Both. I, I, I think many MPs would argue that you should uh, maybe review the thresholds with a view to cutting it you know, further down the line. And I think what Rishi Sunak can potentially do is outline a plan to do that, none of which takes into effect this side of an election, so that he's he can he's got that ploy, he's got that, you know, policy to to present to the nation and to the activists and the MPs to sort of win back a bit of favour in what is quite a difficult time to you yeah. know, be a conservative activist. But, you know, he doesn't necessarily have to commit on the, unless they win the next election. It sets up a potential stumbling block for the Labour Party. But if they if they did abolish it how would they fill the gap in the coffers? Because there'd be £7 billion pounds less in the tre in the Treasury coffers. And that's absolutely the question that not only the opposition, but some Labour, uh, some Conservative MPs and activists will be asking, you know, you know, have Jeremy Hunt repeatedly talking about we don't necessarily have enough scope for tax cuts, but this is the tax cut that's being floated. And I think personally, and a lot of people might agree, this isn't necessarily the one that I'd put top of the list. Yeah, it won't be, it won't be abolished. But reform, yes, potentially, definitely not. Abolished. So the way he could sell it would be, well, look, I, we're in a cost of living crisis. I can't do what I would really like to do at the moment, but my, this is the direction of travel. And if everything goes well, and if we get re-elected by the end of the next parliament, I would like to be in a position to abolish it. I mean, that's that's what he would say, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not even sure if that's the right signal to send. As Tim said earlier, I think some of the most wealthiest people in the country find really creative ways not to pay. Um, uh, inheritance tax. So so it, it is ripe for reform. I think there is a good argument for reform. And actually, most young people, I mean, we might talk about housing later, the way that they, the only way they can afford a deposit is to receive an inheritance from a, a relative. So it's an important part of our social fabric, but it is ripe for reform. I'm not sure if Rishi and his team are going to be able to sell that vision in, in, a, in a way that makes sense, but, you know... Actually, I really would like to talk about housing later. I know it's a subject that you want to talk about, but the Lib Dems at their conference today, they've had a right old argument about yeah. it. So um, if, you, if you want to ask a question about housing, you'll probably get put through. <laughs> That's the secret of the, the programme. Uh, right, let's move on to a text question from Daniel in Ealing, who says, is it helpful for the Home Secretary to take such a firm stance over the armed police protests. Now, Sola Braverman tweeted yesterday to say that armed police officers have her full backing after an unidentified officer was charged with murder over the shooting of unarmed man Chris Cubber in Stratham last year. Some commentators say the Home Secretary could even be in contempt of court. And I would ask you all to be a little bit careful. Mm. Bear in mind there is an ongoing court case here. But apparently hundreds of Met Police officers have handed in their weapons over the last 48 hours in protest at, at all of this. And the army was said to be ready to sort of come to the aid of the Met, but apparently that isn't going to be necessary, we read this evening. Um, Tom, let's start with you on this one. So I think... Uh, to answer the question directly, I think the, the Home Secretary has been quite irresponsible in saying something about an ongoing court case. My understanding is that it's harder to be in contempt of court on the prosecution side than it is on the defence side for various reasons, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to shy away from that anyway. What I will say is that, in principle, if we're going to have armed officers, and we do t sometimes need to have armed officers, and if those armed officers uh, shoot people, there has to be a process of, of investigation of those shootings. And there has to be, at the end of it, the possibility, at least, of criminal charges being brought, because people with guns can act in dangerous ways. That doesn't mean that all armed police officers, by any means, are irresponsible. But if you don't have that system, effectively, what you've got is a licence to kill for any armed officer well, who just go around killing well, anybody that's what I'm saying. with no and, consequence. And, and, and nobody wants that. So... Of course, sometimes there could be a situation where the Crown Prosecution Service thinks that there is enough evidence to bring prosecution. That is not in itself a reason for armed officers to start handing their guns in because they are not at risk so long as they shouldn't be at risk mm. as long as they follow the, the correct procedures. And I'm, I'm very uncomfortable about the idea that officers think that the simple fact of someone being charged with a crime is enough justification for them to be concerned about the, 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 the risks to them 
of, of, of carrying a gun and potentially having to use it. I, I think it is... Um, look, we, we've got to let justice take its course here, but I don't think it's beyond, beyond the bounds of possibility that armed officers could do the wrong thing sometimes. Mm. And if they do, they, they should face the consequences of that. Mm. Tammy? Um, I think they have to feel trust in the process. So, you know, having travelled to lots of countries where armed um, police officers are just everywhere on, on the streets, uh, it still surprises me how little armed officers we see. So, yes, if you walk around Westminster, you see them, but, you know, some in big cities, but but hardly ever. So um, I do think, you know, they, there has to be an investigation, there has to be a process, and there has to be the option. You know, the trouble is you you make a bad decision or you make the wrong decision when you're carrying a weapon. It's, it's very different to a taser or something else. Um, so... I, I absolutely don't understand why the, the police officers are feeling um, the position they are at the moment because they probably just don't feel there's enough trust in the system. Mm. Emma? I think the way that Sue Ellen Braverman's comments have been helpful is that the police have gone back to work. You know, as you said, uh, introducing the question, the army haven't been required in the way that, we, you know, they thought they were. They were called upon standby but haven't been needed. I think if that's what the police needed to have faith in the system and to get back to work, then obviously that's incredibly helpful. But I do agree with Tom. We shouldn't really be in a situation where the police feel um, or may feel that... that the possibility of facing criminal charges shouldn't be applied to them. I'm um, mm. not suggesting that that is necessarily what they feel, but it does feel like an implication. But the um, worst thing would be to get into a position where nobody wants, nobody in the police force wants to go into an armed mm. unit because they are vital to the policing of this country. Mm. And you can understand why uh, sometimes, I mean, there have been various incidents over the past 10 years which have been proved to be controversial and um, the, the role of armed police has come into question possibly more often than it had in the previous 10 or 20 years. And I think it's right that uh, armed police feel that they have the right protections that enable them to do their jobs so that they're not overly concerned about, you know, um, it, what they feel is inappropriate potential criminal responsibility. But there should still be criminal responsibility. We can't get away from that. And, you know, thankfully, we have very few incidents comparative to other countries of police shootings. But that means that every time we have one, we need to treat it with the utmost severity. Samuel. Yeah, no, uh, agreed to with most of what's said. You know, thankfully, it's very rare that incidents like this happen in this country. But for the family of Chris Cabo, you know, the rarity means nothing because they've lost a, a loved one. Um, but I can also empathise with where the officers are at. I mean, it's not like an officer was just charged with any crime. It was murder, right? And so this could, could it literally be, you know, what, it is very serious. Um, I think the important thing to say is I haven't seen the footage. Um, I don't think anyone in the room has seen the footage. I'm not sure the Home Secretary have seen the footage. I'm sure most of the officers who were very alarmed haven't also seen the footage, but we do know that the CPS has seen the footage. Um, and it, it's not like it was a knee-jerk reaction. You know, they didn't just charge uh, the officer after a day or after a week. This has been nearly a year. Um, and I think we we should all call for calm. And yes, the officers should go back to work. If, and and, and, um, and frankly, they have or most of them as far as we're aware. And we just have to see how this plays out. And I think that there will be lessons to learn uh, regardless of, of, of the outcome. OK. Uh, no text or questions on housing so far. You're failing me at the moment, so please please, please do ask that. I mean, the Liberal Democrats today, they've been debating whether there should be housing targets, because if you remember, the government abolished housing targets a few months ago, and uh, that's the thing that they've fallen out about at their conference. So uh, Tim Farron made, apparently, a, a barnstorming speech this afternoon trying to get the delegates to vote for the leadership, um, but it rather backfired on him, it has to be said. So we we might do a little bit on that a little bit later. Uh, any other subject that you want to phone in about as well? 0345 6060 973 uh, HS2, that seems to be one of the big stories of the day as well. It's 16 minutes past eight. This is LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 20 past eight. Um, let me give you a little insight into what we talk about during the breaks um, in, in this programme. Uh, Tani just said something, and I thought I must have misheard her, but I hadn't. And she has given me permission to say, say this. Um, you, you say the House of Laws is the least misogynistic place that you've ever worked. I, I'm quite surprised by that. Uh, most people are when I say <laughs> it. So... Um, Coming from sport background, so there's been a lot of changes in, in the last few years and has improved, but um, it, it still is, you know, there's some challenges in terms of, of, of how women are, are treated within sport. So I'm not sure whether it's, you know, the average age of peers or the fact that once you get the title, you know, you're all kind of treated relatively equal. Um, I couldn't say that every woman in the building feels the same way as I do. Certainly, uh, I, I think, you know, there's been a number of cases over the years, you know, there's being you know big deep dives into the culture of the place i think if you're a young person working in parliament it's pretty tough uh depending which end of the building you work in it's it's pretty tough but as a female peer um i've i've never had any issue whatsoever um and only had a couple of tiny hints of ableism as well so again which doesn't sort of um it's not like that in the outside world I was going to say real world. So I do think the world outside Parliament, I do call it the real world, because mm. <laughs> Parliament is not the real world. I interviewed your colleague, uh, Lord Woolley, Simon Woolley, a few, well, but this time last year, his book came out, and he was telling a story of how when he was first appointed to the Lords, um, he was mistaken for somebody who did the photocopying. Yeah, I can absolutely imagine that. Which, yeah. however you sort of say that, I mean, it's... <sighs> It must have taken the edge off it for him, in, in, in a sense, I, w I would have thought. I mean, Samuel, you're, you're black. Um, in in terms of, do you have you found that in politics, that you feel that you've had a more difficult passage than somebody who is not from an ethnic minority has had? Um, n not really, but that's probably because... Um I've taken a, a path that was maybe least travelled and so, you know, if somebody was looking for someone that ticked a bunch of boxes, I, was, I am one of very few people, particularly in the, centre, the world of centre-right. Um, and so in that respect, maybe not so. Having said that, you know, when it's come to maybe going up that, to that extra level, you know, just about becoming the mayoral candidate or whatever. Yeah, why didn't you? Because I, I thought you were a dead cert to be in the final of that. I think there's a lot of politics involved in that. Um, you know, some people say I'm a bit outspoken. <laughs> Probably right. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you know, Rishi Sunak's got his own agenda. You know, he's, he's going to need to win a general... Well, he's going to want to win a general election in the next year or so. So perhaps having a mayoral candidate that maybe has a very clear vision and direction of travel, might like, like the one I have, might not have been the best thing for, for him or, or them, in their opinion. That's fine, that's politics, right? Live to fight another day. Right, let's uh, move on to another question. It's from Dan in Chester. Dan, what would you like to ask? Yeah, so my question is, is there a place for democracy in the planning process? Um, because applications are submitted by professional planners on the private side. They're dealt with by local authority planners. Um, they then get taken to the planning committee where you know, untrained councillors consider the applications and refuse them when they should be permitted and then it goes to a professional planning inspector at the uh, at central government and they overturn the committee's decision anyway so is there a point in kind of wasting people's time and delaying housing um, when in reality it seems to be professionals who are dealing with it all the way through and should we just pass it straight to an inspector well, here's our housing question, I guess. We, we, we can stretch the boundaries of this um, a, a, a little bit as well. And by the way, Tani wants a question. What did you want a question on? Closure um, of ticket offices. Potential closure station. of ticket so offices. So there's another one that yeah. you could phone in about. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been councillors. I am a councillor. You are a councillor. Uh, well, I sit on a planning so. committee. <laughs> <laughs> I used to chair like, a, a committee responsible for local plan, 15,000 homes. Oh, gosh, you're going to have to shut me off in a bit. Go on. I mean, look, the, the, the I honest truth... I others don't really want to answer uh, this. I'm sure, sure they, I mean, the honest truth is localism has failed when, it's come, when it comes to planning. Um, and so the, the, the question is, is very valid. Um, I think the answer is you need to find a way to inspire folks who don't necessarily engage with lo local politics um, to engage with the housing and planning processes. So that's young people, renters, people who are maybe more transient um, and, and people who can't afford to deposit for a home, firstly. Secondly, I think I, I wouldn't necessarily take away 
all of the politics from housing, but I think sometimes the, the, the politics is too hyper-local. And so I like the idea of regional mayors or combined authority leaders being able to have much more strategic view very quickly about where homes should be built and maybe some of the emotion that then moved out of it to an extent. So yeah, I think this, the planning system is completely broken. I think localism has failed and more needs to be done to engage uh, those who are probably at least likely to be able to, to buy their own home. But, I mean, Dan is essentially saying that the uh, councils always seem to reject... Not plans. always. But there does seem to be... I mean, I, I look at it from the other end as somebody who recently has tried to get a planning application through, nothing very spectacular at all. And it is... Honestly, it's like, it's like treading through slurry. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there are some things that need to be changed. And when I worked in Downing Street, we had a really fantastic housing white paper where we looked at things like permitted developments and how we can make it easier for people to expand their homes or um, uh, for developers to regenerate high streets, etc. But obviously, we lost in, is it Chemisham? Chemisham? Chem, Chem, what did we lose? Somewhere in Amersham and... Chesham. 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 So many now. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thanks for that. One nil, one nil. But yeah, we, we, we lost and, and, and then everyone got cold feet and now we are where we are. And what we don't have is any courage when it comes to housing. I and mean, we saw what happened in the Lib Dem conference today. I mean, I was so, I'm not a member of the Liberal Democrats. I will never be a Lib Dem. But I was so proud of the young people uh, who, who really stood up. Just explain for our listeners what happened. So essentially, Tim Farron, who I've, I've always thought was, you know, relatively sensible, um, uh, decided that he wanted to to give a really uh, passionate speech about why uh, people who want homes to be built are basically all Thatcherites. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being a Thatcherite, of course, I'm a Tory, but, you know, nonetheless, <laughs> um, you know, he's, he's basically, you know, abusing the people who are literally saying, look, nobody's speaking up for us. And, of course, the Lib Dems, um, their, one of their main objectives this week was to abolish ha their housing targets of around 380,000 homes uh, a year um, because they want to, you know, encroach on... Uh, conservative seats and, 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 and make sure that they're seen as the, the NIMBYs in chief, which they already are locally anyway, in most most places. Um, and so, yeah, so a bunch of young Lib, Lib Dems said, look, we're not going to have it. Um, we want our voices to be heard. Um, this is not right. It's morally incorrect. And they won on the on the on the. On the and that's the great thing about Lib Dem conferences. They actually do talk about policy, which Labour used to do, but Labour and Conservatives now, it's just basically a rally. Tanny. Um, so it's not something I've spent a huge amount of time considering before now, except I did sit on the board of Olympic Park uh, and I had an amendment in um, a localism bill which made Olympic Park a mayoral development corporation. Uh, and for that, it made a lot of sense because all the promises around 2012 with Legacy about how you can get the three London boroughs to work together was really important so that, you know, you're, you're actually taking a, a cross-boundary approach to it. And I think that's kind of really important. I think you... Yeah, there's some localism with it, but I think you have to take a bit more of a helicopter view about the impact and how. So actually, one of the things that happened at Olympic Park, they're able to look at schools and and lots of other things. And it has um, worked there. Hasn't there's it? been some amazing yeah. stuff there. But the reality of the planet is that it's easier to open a chicken shop on the high street than it is to open a yoga studio. And not only cost of living crisis, we've got an inactivity crisis, oh. uh, and you know we've got a generation of young people who are more likely to die before their parents because of a whole range of issues. Um, so I do think we we need to be just more mindful about what we're doing because actually, you know, I live in the northeast of England, right on the Red Wall, uh, and you know we've got high streets are dying. You've got issues with housing. Um, you know, some of the housing's not great. There's not enough. Uh, house prices are so different to, for, to down south. But we've we've got to do more to try and regenerate the local communities. Mm. And the great thing about the Olympic Park is you have the world's greatest football team there as well. So <laughs> yes. What's not to like, Emma? <laughs> um, I think in some senses there is democracy in planning already because what local councillors and local MPs tend to do is listen to the voices of their electorate uh, who tend to be homeowners in many cases um, who say, no, I'm good, thanks. I've, I've got my house, I've got my nice view out my window or I've you know got whatever it is nearby that I don't want to be built on, usually a train station car park or something ridiculous. <laughs> Um, but that that is democracy. Now, you might not like it, and I certainly do not like it, but I think what we need to do is make sure that when councillors or MPs are considering local housing development, they're considering the needs of the people who aren't speaking up, and often that is young people who, for whatever reason, don't feel uh, empowered to participate in the system or don't feel like their voices will be heard, um, and make sure that actually we reflect all of their views and wishes as well. And I think actually, to go to Dan's point, there are some really good examples of democracy and planning working really well. 
So uh, local um, inner London housing, social housing regeneration projects. There have been, I think, 12 in London so far where social housing residents have been able to vote on, do you want to knock down your homes? We will build new ones. They will be for you. You will be able to profit from it, not only in terms of the, you know, the quality of the home, but we will densify uh, that area, there will be more properties available and we will sell them on to other people to cover their costs. 11 of them out of 12 were approved on the first ballot. One, they went away, they made some changes, they came back and the local residents went, yep, yeah, fantastic, better homes for us, more homes for other people. So there are really good examples of where democracy and planning can work, but I think Dan is probably trying to highlight, you know, mm -hmm. MPs and councillors who who listen to homeowners often who say, no, I'm good, thanks, doesn't matter yeah. about everybody else. But your example also is an urban centre not Lib Dem, Conservative, Battlegrounds, yes. you know, suburbia, shires, etc. Tom? I think, well, one of the things that all unbuilt housing developments have in common is that nobody lives in them, and therefore there aren't any voters in them yet. There might be voters in there in 5, 10, 15 years' time if you build them, but there aren't any now, and councillors, MPs, everyone is accountable to the electorate that exists now and not the electorate of the future. Um, to be fair to councillors, I mean, I've got a friend who's a, who's a Labour councillor, I should say, in, in and London, who sits on a planning committee, who, who says that you know one of her key responsibilities is to is to get houses built and uh, uh, sometimes over the, over the objections of, um, of others who might be part of the process. So it's not that councillors are automatically a blockage, but it is that um, at a local level, people feel that immediate pressure from their current residents more than, more than other pressures. So all of housing has to be a democratic process, but it needs to be a democratic process at the right level. And actually, if you set national targets or regional targets um, but through democratic processes like general elections like mayoral elections like um, the various processes that we that we have and use those to mandate the development that we need because we need a lot more houses in the country i think that's something that you know everyone agrees with across parties it's just that we need more houses in the round but we maybe don't need that house there and then everyone just thinks about that house there and then houses don't get built so you do need ways of um, of taking decisions at a more strategic level than sometimes local councillors are able to think about. Mm. Great stuff. Right, we'll take more of your questions in just a moment. 0345 6060 It's 8.32. News headlines on LBC with Charlotte Morgan. We're told several historic sexual offence allegations have been made to the Metropolitan Police since a news report about Russell Brand. They're said to have happened in London as well as elsewhere in the country. The comedian denies claims against him. The Prime Minister says he is committed to levelling up but has refused to confirm if the high-speed rail line HS2 will reach Manchester. It's widely reported it'll stop at Birmingham to save money. And Gatwick Airport has announced a temporary limit on flights until Sunday. A third of air traffic control staff are on sick leave. LBC weather turning dry for most overnight with the odd lingering shower. Some rain in the south and far northwest by dawn and a low of six. LBC.
Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. They lose section 8 36 on LBC. We have Baroness Tani Gray Thompson. And for people who, whenever I introduce a member of the House of Lords and put their Christian name in it, I get the pedants texting in saying, That's not correct. It, I'm technically Tani, Baroness Gray Thompson. Yeah. Or just call me Tani. I do, I, I do, but I, I like to give the full title at the beginning. Uh, Samuel Kasumu is here, Tom Hamilton and Emma Ravel. Uh, let's do a text question from Kevin in Oxfordshire. The Lib Dems seem to be courting the idea of cozying up to Labour in some form after the next election. Is contemplating coalition again a good move on their part? Now, Sir Ed Davey, their leader, has told Sky News today that the Lib Dems could, quotes, play a critical role in rem removing the Conservatives from power. He refused Refuse to speculate about any specific deals, though. Um, Tom Hamilton, this, this I'm sure is occupying a lot of time among Labour strategists. What, what do they want for the Lib? I mean, if they don't get the majority mm -hmm. that they, that I think we all expect at the moment, um, under what circumstances would there be some sort of coalition agreement? And other people are saying, well, that there ought to be some kind of agreement before the election, a sort of anti-Tory coalition so we we stand aside in one seat and you stand in that one they people have talked about that as a sort of progressive alliance where they stand they 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 choose which one stands i completely disagree with that and to be fair i think both the lib dem leadership and the, and the labor leadership also don't agree with it it isn't it isn't going to happen um but not publicly anyway well no but it, it it, it couldn't happen privately because you can't not stand if, you, you, if, if, no, you're, if you're standing. You can put no effort into it. Yeah, but, but that will happen anyway. So the really interesting thing about the electoral arithmetic this time, and it's not always true. It just it depends on how the chips lie at each election, is that um, all of the seats that Labour needs to win to form a government, all of them are you know up to like the the, the two hundredth target seat are not held by the Lib Dems, and therefore they are simply not fighting Lib Dem health seats. And it works the other way as well. The Lib Dems, um, there are hardly any Labour health seats in their top 30 or 40 targets as well. So if they just put the resources into the seats that it's easiest for them to win, which is a, a rational decision they should make separately from the other decisions, they simply won't be taking each other on. It doesn't mean they like each other. And there's places like, like there's a big row going on at the moment in Mid-Bedfordshire mid between the two parties about which of them is best placed to take out, to take on the Tories. Um, Labour don't are. mention the candidates because we'll have to mention them. I won't mention the candidates. I can't remember the names anyway, don't worry. <laughs> um, but... Um, so far as after the election is concerned, I mean, I know it's a boring answer, but the correct answer is, well, let's lay, wait and see what, what the result is and what the numbers look like. And if Labour is short of a majority, we'll have to work out what to do. But the Labour position for several elections has always been, we won't do a coalition, whatever the numbers are. We will basically challenge the other parties to either keep us in, keep us in office or vote us out and trust that the Lib Dems in particular, the SNP, would not want to be responsible for putting, mm. putting the Tories in. Now, that's a gamble, but I think they're probably right. Um, Tani, when you hear questions like this, do, does it make you uh, proud that you're a crossbencher? You don't have to have all of these worries, these tribal oh, worries. it is such a wonderful place to be. I mean, the best and worst is that nobody tells me how to vote. Uh, and I can't I, imagine anyone daring. Well, <laughs> but, and, and I genuinely, before every vote, I go and, you know, I know exactly what I'm voting on. Because I think if I can't explain in five sentences why I voted a certain way, So there's no whip vote. for the crossbenchers? No whip at all. Um, uh so I'm fascinated by all the polling and what happens, but as, as a crossbencher, it doesn't particularly affect me. Um, if I look back to the last coalition, um, that was it was really hard work being in the Lords with the coalition, especially because uh, a, a whole number of Lib Dems were voting for things they didn't personally agree with um, and were speaking against legislation that they would have supported weeks earlier and, you know, uh, when they'd been out of the coalition. So there, there was an extent I felt uh, a certain amount of sympathy for some of the peers. But then if you accept the coalition and you accept a place in the administration, you know, you... you and, and it's down to selling your soul. That's what you, you have to do. So I wouldn't be looking forward to uh, a, another coalition because I think it, it makes um, politics really complicated in the Lords, probably less so in, in the Commons than, than at our end. But because we always know we're coming back uh, and you get to know people in a, in a different way because you get to know them over a long period of time. It is quite sad when you see people not standing up for the things they believe in. Samuel. Mm. 
I mean, to be honest, I really don't care about what Labour or the Lib Dems <laughs> decide to do or what they're, what they're planning. But I mean, on, on All right, a... let's put it another way. <laughs> you saw the way the coalition operated between 2010 and 2015. Uh, if you were advising the Lib Dems on what they should do now, obviously they had a catastrophic result in 2015, yep. which in many ways I think was actually unfair, given that they got 75% of their manifesto promises through. Yeah. Um, would you advise them just to steer clear of any coalition, doesn't matter which party with, because inevitably they're going to be the kicking boys? Yeah, I think um, they, they have a clear strategy right now, which is to win seats in the southwest and some of the uh, some of the east of, of England. Um, most of those seats, well, pretty much all those seats are conservative seats. And to be completely honest, some of those seats um, look like they're, they're probably already gone. I'm not going to name some of those because some of the people there are my, my mates. <laughs> um, and, and so I think their main objective is to get to a point where they're, you know, 30, 40, maybe even, dare I say it, 50. Are, are you trying to be a candidate for the next election? Uh, no, no. Why? Uh, because there are other things I'd like to do, um, bluntly. And, and also, to be completely honest with you, um, uh, my ambitions has never been one where I could decide to, you know, forego some of the things I've, I, I believe in in order for me to become a member of parliament. And so there's some things that, you know, that the prime minister you know, might might be doing in the next 12 months that I might not completely agree with. So it's probably best I kind of sit this one out. But there is speculation that the Tories might, um, uh, should we say, pull Susan Hall out of the race for London Mayor. If they did, would you be tempted to step back in? No. Um, again, there's a general election next year, and I think it's right that Prime Minister has a, a, a candidate trying to be London Mayor that might be a bit more malleable to his direction of travel. Um, with Susan Hall, I would say she won fair and square. So, you know, it's a bit like when Boris was Prime Minister, he won fair and square. And, and, and so, you know, she should have the opportunity to run and, and win or lose. And I wish her all the best. And she's always been very kind to me, so I have nothing bad to say on her. About and she her. does listen to this programme, so... Oh, no, good. <laughs> hello, hello, Susan. <laughs> uh, Emma. Well, I think the Lib Dems have to contemplate coalition because otherwise, what's the point? They, they I mean, put it very politely, they're not, yeah, Ed Davies not going to be the next Prime Minister. There's not going to be a, a Lib Dem landslide. So your opportunities are, talk honestly and openly about what, possibilities are open to you after the next election whether it's a hung parliament or a coalition or something like that or just admit we're going to be in opposition forever we're never going to achieve anything and I say this as someone who was you know a part of my my misspent youth uh, a student Lib Dem during Oof, the coalition this years trust. <laughs> I, try being a student Lib Dem in 2010 2011 it was difficult believe me um but you know uh, if, it, if it helps the age of 16, I was a member of the Liberal Party. We all go yes. through it. Yeah. <laughs> I did not go through it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it was an incredibly difficult time and, you know, people were on like me who were on the centre-right of the Lib Dems were basically being told to go away and join the Conservatives well um, was what we were told quite regularly because they found a lot of MPs uh, a lot of Lib Dems sorry found coalition really difficult because they were having to compromise almost for the first time ever because they've always been in opposition and been able to just you know say whatever principled thing uh, they wanted which was respected but at the same time if you're in government you have to talk about compromises so I think acknowledging that they could be in coalition and talking openly about what that means for them is probably a good idea Are you still in touch with any of those Lib Dems from that time? A couple, not very many. I, I mean, how, on a scale of one to ten, how horrified are they that you work for the Centre for Policy Studies? They're not delighted. No. <laughs> <laughs> they're, not, they're not delighted. I mean, that kind of, you kind of are Liz Trust 20 years on, aren't you? Don't say that, Ian. Don't say that. <laughs> I, uh, I, well, I, look, I, I'm not sure where you go with that. Liberal, yeah, yes, indeed. Although she might say she was as well. So, you know. who would you have as your chancellor? Oh god, what a difficult question. I probably, probably I'd have to, I'd have to pluck a, a, a friendly Lib Dem out of obscurity that you wouldn't have heard of. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, we're going to come to Tani's favourite question on ticket office closures in just a few moments' time. If that doesn't keep you listening, I don't know what will. It's eight forty-five. <laughs> LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. End of the line for HS2, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown. I think it's very sad that we can't get an agreement on this basic infrastructure. You know, every country in Europe is doing high-speed rail. Britain is in danger of having 19th century solutions to 21st century problems. If you embark on a big infrastructure project, you cause confusion and chaos. If you just give up on a project halfway through, it does not make sense. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. L BC.
Matt. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. Somebody has texted, I bet Tanny has never voted Conservative in a general election. Well, of course, peers aren't allowed to vote at all in general elections now, but you you have voted some in the past. Yeah, I've, and... I've voted Conservative. I've voted for everybody, to be honest. I've, I kind of, depending on what the issues are, I, I move left and right. But yeah, when it's, it's us lunatics and prisoners... And that's the words in the legislation, so I think I'm allowed to use them. But we're not allowed to vote in the general election. <laughs> right, let's move on to Nikki in Sunderland, who's texted, How does the panel feel about the closure of rail ticket offices? Is the 2010 Equality Act fit for purpose? Tanny. Oh, here we go. This is your uh, moment. So, no, the Equality Act is not fit for purpose. It hasn't served disabled people very well. Uh, and actually, I was one who always wanted an Equality Act, not a Disability Discrimination Act. Uh, and then it's 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 been a bit useless for us. Um, so ticket office closures, the bit I've been spending a lot of time talking about over the summer, is how it's going to affect disabled people's ability to travel. Uh, and we have a legal right to turn up and go. And what we're now being very strongly pushed towards is having to book two hours in advance before we get a train. So. If that's what we have to make every MP do it uh, and everyone who's making these decisions and then see how easy it is. So it's, it's going to make travelling for disabled people really hard. There's going to be um, safety issues, um, you know, visually impaired people. How do you find somebody wandering around a train station? Um, there are so many worries with this. Uh, and actually disabled people, you know, need to get to work, pay taxes, contribute to society. And if this goes ahead, it's just going to make our but life difficult. There is a legal duty, isn't there, on um, rail companies, on presumably the government also, to provide equal access for disabled people already. So just under the current legislation, if someone was to bring a legal case, I would have thought they would stand quite a good chance. Uh, it gets ignored uh, a lot of the time. And then the legal aid, uh, sentencing and punishment of offenders legislation cut most disabled people's ability to use legal aid to take cases. So the biggest changes uh, in, in access have come when it's gone legal, and that's just really difficult. So uh, it just ignored every single step of, of the way. Uh, and there's a reason the government and the train companies are refusing to publish their equality impact assessments, which when you do that, that suggests that... Um, and the ones that we, we have seen really explicitly say disabled people mm. are going to be worse off. It's interesting what you say about MPs having to do this because um, I had the experience last year of um, basically d damaging both my knees and it was my first experience as a disabled person travelling from A to B and just seeing what it was like. And up until then, I'd always thought, yeah, why do we need guards on trains? Get rid of them. And then I did, then I really realised, and it's only when when it it sort of you yeah. you experience it that you you see exactly what people do, and they they and they were absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I'm left on trains. Uh, you have to kind of sometimes beg to get on a train. Uh, you turn up at train station, and then two or three trains can go through before you're you're helped on. So it just makes life really difficult. So. I, I sort of say, I just want the same miserable experience of commuting as everyone else. Mm. That is my aspiration, which I, I, I don't have. It's a low have. bar. It is a really, <laughs> really low bar. Um, and I just think they could do better. So I'm not objecting uh, per se to ticket offices closing, but all we're being told is, don't worry, it'll be better. And there's no proof of what better is going to look mm. like. OK, right. Uh, do uh, any of you three want to comment on this? Or if not, we can move on to the next one. The only thing I was going to say about it is that it's um, it's an example of uh, this, uh, several areas now where um, the fact that for most of us, life is easier. We can do more things online. We don't need to use cash anymore. Mm -hmm. We can get on a train and show someone our phone later on. Um, it, it becomes an excuse for cost cutting where... But, but leaves a lot of people, not just disabled people, but a, a, a lot of other people who don't have the same ability to use certain kinds of um, certain kinds of technology out in the cold. I think it's really important that, uh, that we don't leave people behind just because some things have become easier for most people. Right, let's move on to Robert in Bromsgrove, who is asking this. The England Cricket Board is bringing in new targets for ethnic and gender diversity across the professional game in this country. Do these types of quotas actually solve the problems which are used to justify them? 
Emma? I think they can in certain circumstances where the sort of targets that are being set are reasonable and appropriate and you have a plan of how to put them into action. I think where it can be a problem is if, if the targets are, uh, are misguided or it's just a target or, or an ambition with no plan of how to get there. You know, you, if you're not setting out, these are the steps that we're going to take. And also how these targets have come about. You know, have you um, engaged with the right people in developing these targets? Do they think they're realistic? Are we chasing these targets for the right reason? Or is it just so we can put out a nice press release saying we we hit the target. Um, I think diversifying cricket is is a great aim. It's just about how how they get there. So, mm. yeah, was, we were talking earlier about um, about a decade ago. I was involved in um, the code for sports governance that David Cameron published, and part of that section two point one to two point three spoke about <laughs> uh, <laughs> <on> boards. <laughs> and uh, specifically, there was there was no target for ethnicity or disability or anything like that, but it was a target for gender diversity. And it said by X date, you, a third of all boards need to be gender diverse. So that meant like if you're all women, I don't know if you're netball, you should have some men, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, when I when I was working on that. On that, um, I said actually, quotas or no quotas. What is more, more most important is the journey that you, you go on, right? So, are you making your recruitment processes fair and open and transparent? Are you encouraging people from different backgrounds to at least try to be in part of certain environments whilst the, whilst they're there? Do they feel that they can function and flourish? So, I think quotas alone will always feel like a tick box in an exercise, and it's all about the journey that an organisation or a country is on and trying to be more inclusive. I don't know if you would agree. Tony, I do, I do actually. Um, so, you know, when I first got involved in sports governance you know there was no diversity whatsoever and you know some of it made the house of lords look diverse mm -hmm. and young where you know our average age across the road is 69 so there, there has been uh, a direction of travel but the quotas do have to be meaningful i should declare i am interim chair of yorkshire cricket mm -hmm. i joined last year to try and kind of rebuild the club after everything that had happened and you know there is still a, a lot of work to do but we have to be asking questions why groups of people don't engage you know it's lack of opportunity it's cost it's not feeling welcome um you know i've sat on uh, a board before now where i was literally there to be the tokenistic disabled person where my opinion wasn't valued i was patronized actually at one point a man picked up my hand and stroked it and told me he'd come and explain how something worked and sam can you not do that <laughs> <laughs> oh, God forbid. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's no point yeah. having a voice around the table yeah. if yeah. you're continuously ignored. But sports are microcosm of society for all the good and, and all the bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, sports should be leading the way on, on, on yeah. a lot of these but things. Some of these environments are incredibly elite, you know, yeah. and, and that's part of the challenge. Elitist, you mean? Elitist, I see. Mm. Yeah. But, I mean, you, you've got the job, apart from opening the batting for Yorkshire, you've got the job <laughs> that every Yorkshire man or woman dreams of, haven't you? Being chair of Yorkshire. Yeah. Um, it's really funny that uh, I've had somebody tell me, how can I possibly understand cricket because I wasn't born in Yorkshire? One person. That is only one person. <laughs> um, but, oh, it's an incredible thing. If, was that Jeff Boycott? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. Um, but th the ability to change and, you know, so by changing some really simple things at Yorkshire on the, the pathway. So until recently, one of the questions that the boys were asked was, did your father or grandfather play cricket for Yorkshire? That immediately excluded yeah. great swathes of people, uh, youngsters who, who live in Yorkshire. Mm. So something like that is something really little. You know, now, um, you know, the, the, the split on, on player pathway has has gone through the roof you know it's it's 45 percent come from a uh, an ethnic minority background compared to a couple of years ago where it was virtually mm. you know, very few but it's knowing what you've got to unlock to bring about the change tom um quotas and targets aren't the solution in themselves but they concentrate minds and help people to think about what else needs to change in order to get more people from particular backgrounds, whatever it might be that the target is about, to participate in the sport? And as, as Tani says, we, Yorkshire in particular, that there are examples of, you know, institutional racism and discrimination in cricket and potentially in other sports. And how do you get beyond that? You need to make it easy for people to participate in sport at all levels. And that sometimes means making the, making the leadership of those sports uh, think about process and that might mean putting a target at the top so that they can work things through to the bottom. And you can even have a diverse panel on radio programmes without even attempting to do it, mm. <laughs> as we see from our panel tonight.
Uh, right, let's go to our fun question. Uh, Will in Crediton has submitted it. Yesterday, the annual London Sheep Drive took place, in which the free men of the city of free men of the city of London <laughs> make use of their ancient right to take livestock into the city by walking sheep across the River Thames. What's the bizarrest activity you've taken part in, Sam? Come back to me. <laughs> you have ten minutes to rehearse this one. Uh, all I have is walking through a field. And... <laughs> you are the male Theresa May. Well, I hope you can, the rest of you can do better than that lame effort. Tanny. OK, 2012 Paralympics. OK, this is probably the stupidest thing, as well as bizarre. 2012 Paralympics, a week before the opening ceremony, I was asked, did I want to take part? I said, yes, I'll do anything. That's not the time to play coy. They said to me, we want to put you in a, your racing chair uh, on a wire and float you a bit above the track. I did not ask the question, how high? Uh, they put me in a, a, a wire, they put me four metres in the air. I was like, oh, is this about how high? And they were like, yeah, about that high. I signed the contract, loads of social media, and then they took me to the main stadium and put me 65 metres in the air. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was horrendous. I, I said a lot of really, really bad words, very loudly, <laughs> uh, and I pretty much threw up from uh, being in the air. Oh, gosh. And, See, and I from... thought you were going to say they wanted you to impersonate the Queen jumping out of the pool. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but it's always the simple questions you should ask, isn't it? Wow. But also, a really stupid wire. Mm. You know, you're not going to be four metres in the air, are you? No. You're not. <laughs> anyway, so I'm not sure it's bizarre, but that's stupid. Well, you're here to tell the tale. That's the main <laughs> thing. Tom? Um, I had to pretend to be Nigel Farage. <laughs> Um, for the purposes of um, TV de debate prep um, before the general election in 2015. And um, uh, I had How to... How did that go? It went OK. I had a copy of the UKIP manifesto in front of me and I can, read a line Can you give us a it. bit of Nigel Farage? I, um, I, I said to her, Mo Band, um, there's, there's only one immigration mug in this room and it's you. <laughs> that didn't sound very much like Nigel. No, I didn't do an impression. But the first time I met Corey, our producer, he was doing. We were doing a general election night rehearsal program, and I'd never met him before. And he came in and played cabinet ministers, and honestly, it was brilliant. I, I would ask him to come into the studio now, but we haven't got time to to replay it. Uh, Emma. Uh, mine might be a little bit like Tanny's Bazaar and potentially stupid. I abseiled off the um, the Barclays building in Canary Wharf. And ste stepping off the edge was Ooh. one of the most terrifying things I've ever done. But I loved it once I got to the bottom. W were you raising money? Uh, yes, for the Lord Mayor of London's <laughs> oh, charity. there had to be a reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, not for fun. Right. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. To uh, Tanny Gray-Thompson, to Samuel Kasumi, Tom Hamilton and Emma Ravel. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to talk about gay conversion therapy. And the fact that the government seems to be about to renege on its promise to introduce legislation to ban it in this country. So I want to hear your views on why you think that they are backtracking on this. Uh, they say it's all very, very difficult and it, it's sort of the law of unintended consequences. I'm not sure I particularly buy that. They've had several years now to get it right. Other countries have done it. So if other countries can do it, why can't the United Kingdom? 0345 606 so 973 is the number to call here on LBC.